The Point of View is sponsored by Cowbell Coffee. Taste it, love it. Welcome to The Point of View. This is your favorite current affair show on television. Here on The Point of View, we get the right guests, ask them relevant questions on issues that matter to you. And tonight's program is a special one with Ghana's Attorney General. Don't forget The Point of View is brought to you by the First National Bank. How can we help you? And Cowbell Coffee, taste it, love it. It's a big interview, not just on a running story, but also to pick the mind of the AG on some issues of law. Stay with us. Welcome back to tonight's show. So the Honorable Attorney General, Godfrey Abu Adami, is our guest for tonight. And he hasn't had any rest. From the day he was sworn in, there's been all kinds of issues. I'm even sure today he was in court because there are many, many issues requiring legal attention. But we're going to talk to him on a controversial issue. Was he sleeping on a job to cost Ghana $170 million in a judgment debt in the case involving the cancellation of a contract of a power supplier. There are other issues that have come up in relation to that case and others. The Honorable Attorney General, good evening. Thanks for joining us on the program. Good evening, Bernard. How is it? Fine, thank you. It must be a very busy time for you. Well, it is to be expected because I uh, assume office um, in the second term of President Adankwa Kufado, and it is unlike the first term where Minister generally will be given opportunity to settle, familiarize themselves with the terrain, and Cases are not forthcoming uh, for a while because really there wouldn't have been decisions by the government which will compel citizens to either sue in the Supreme Court or the High Court and all. But you are assuming office, the second term of the president, already four years have been done. So there have been various decisions, measures taken and all that. And there have been people already with cases running in the court. So you are already working into cases pending already. Some of them judgment, some of them I was even handing them, and therefore I have to continue. So the situation is clearly different from mm. the first But for one. somebody like you, who was a deputy attorney yeah. general, this is not as new, for, because you are quite familiar with what happens here. I think that's what I actually say, said, that some of the cases I was even handling already, mm. and, and I, co I, I continued. Mm. Some of them, um, perhaps I referred the matters, uh, I do think have been made to the treason trial, where it was previously a trial for a treason felony and I took the view that I think the charges will satisfy the purposes of, of uh, the offenses uh, uh, or the act will actually qualify for the offense of treason and therefore we have to institute charges for treason and that would actually make even a trial faster because treason trial is not a jury trial unlike a treason felony whereby you have to have recourse to a jury a uh, jury, they could make any determination in a way that you may not have so much control over. But if you have a court presided over by a judge or three judges solely to determine questions of both fact and law, it is always safer because the judges will have a better appreciation of the circumstances, circumstances and law. And therefore, if the facts really fit the offense of treason, then you have to charge treason. So these are. Sorry. You seem to be an so, attorney general who prefers to go to court yourself on some issues because I understand. For this particular case, you've been representing yourself. I think that was the back rest with the attorney and, and for that matter, um, it, unless it is practically impossible, uh, unless it is really matter that you think can be ably handled um, without your personal involvement, you really have no excuse but to, to do it. And indeed, what I'm doing is not novel. President Kufado, when he was attorney general, personally prosecuted a number of cases. Um, Republic versus Vita Solobe, and Ibrahim Adam, and, and all others. And apart from that, also conducted personal, cons personally conducted constitutional cases in the various courts and all. And w what I am doing is really no different from when I was Deputy Attorney General. Apart from various meetings and advice that I gave, I was also going to court, so really it, it's, it's no different at all. Um, Joe Gatti, when I was Attorney General, also prosecuting matters personally. Ayuko, too, did the same personally. Um, so many of the, maybe my, my predecessor, immediate predecessor, Madame Kufu, personally also went to court on a number of cases and all. So it is not novel. 
I will not say that it's not. On wrong. the specific case of the GPGC, <coughs> the termination of the contract, the arbitration, the appeal for an extension, and where we are, were you right. personally involved prior to becoming full Attorney General? I was involved only from the, the point of the um, court proceedings, and I'm using court for um, the purposes of uh, lay listeners. So generic. The arbitration mm -hmm. proceedings. Mm -hmm. Yes, upon the commencement of arbitration proceedings, because hitherto I was responsible for conduct of um, cases, civil cases, yes, I was entrusted with the conduct of the trial. And indeed, I conducted the trial together with external lawyers. The state had external lawyers, Amufine partners. Um, we also had lawyers from the office of the attorney and then together with myself also conducted the trial. So from that point, and that was in August 2020, I was involved. So the point must also, I think it's a very good question that you ask. People now are alleging that the state did not handle the matter. Clearly it was wrong. The matter was actually handled prior to my becoming a tangerer. The matter was handled when I was deputy attorney And I'm saying that the arbitration which was instituted in 2018, or was it? Yes, 2018. Was vigorously contested. The state filed relevant challenges to the, the um, arbitration processes, and that culminated in a trial. The trial lasted for one whole week and was conducted virtually. It was unlike other matters that we had to travel to London. In this case, we sat in Accra and did a trial virtually at Moven Peak Hotel. So, um, and each day, the proceedings lasted virtually the whole day. It was from 9 to 5 p.m. every day. It was a full trial, was witnessed by various members of government. The Minister for Energy, uh, Mr. Amewu, even came to witness proceedings, saw me on my feet arguing the matter. And um, the, the Office of the President, Central Representatives and all, Mr. Koi Suman came there. So it, was, <laughs> it was a full trial conducted, yes, virtually. And the trial was, as I said, in August. And then proceedings were adjourned for delivery of award. The award is a judgment. And the judgment was given in January 2021. So ordinarily, that ought to have ended the matter. Because arbitration proceedings, in a sense, are not appealable. Arbitral awards are final. There's finality to arbitral awards. After an arbitration has delivered its award, it's not appealable. So the state will only have to perhaps go the extra mile. And that is what we sought to do for the state. The state just felt outraged by the um, imposition of this amount. The judgment debt was $134 million, um, cost of about three point something million dollars, so let's say about $4 million. And, and that was it. And now people are saying $170 million. I don't know where the mathematics uh, came from. I'm not a mathematician. Um, my <laughs> competence is in law, so I don't know. If it's 168, 140, I don't know. 150, I don't know. So that was it. And th this award was in January 2021. At that time, I had not been appointed attorney general. At that time, I had actually no official capacity at all. And I say I had no official capacity because unlike certain ministries where there was the appointment of president's representative, and also at attorney general, there was no appointment of president's representative. I don't know if Bernard had an announcement about me that I have been appointed president's representative for any ministry. I have not been appointed president's representative for any ministry at all. So from January up to my appointment in March, 20, March 2021, I had no official capacity. So, and that was a period that a law firm headed by Sherry Blair QC, Madame Sherry Blair QC, Omnia Strategy, Omnia Strategy LLP, represented the government of Ghana that it could ch file a challenge. Of course, the government of Ghana, we don't like our administration with all respect, it's not like other administration where the Supreme Court has actually cited them for um, acts which suggest a deliberate attempt to occasion loss of the state. They create loot and share phenomenon. You remember that, that the Supreme Court justice even had to comment on it that the manner in which some judgment debt was occasioned actually suggested an endeavor or a deliberate <laughs> plan to orchestrate financial loss to the state. So the president also Yes, considering yes, if that's the opportunity, if this law firm is saying that they ca they can they can uh, fire a challenge. Why not? So, but did they give you the basis for the challenge? Because well you, and they, I, you they, and I know that 
arbitration was, award, yes. and apart from three conditions, right. either there was corruption, either you were not aware, or, lack or of there was lack of jurisdiction, yes. that yes. appeal is not going to it's succeed final. anyway. Yeah, precisely. So why did you even yes. agree for Omnia yes. to even say yes. they were going to do an extension? Hold on. So I think I'm actually happy that you appreciate these um, factors which can result in a possible challenge of an arbitral award. Because the impression out there is that the government actually had a right to appeal and the government slept on that right of, of appeal. So it is good No, that you have the right, you know, but it's based no, on your judgment on your chances of success. Yes, what I'm saying is that an arbitral award is not open to appeal. It is not like a regular civil matter where you have had judgment delivered. Of course. And then you can say you are appealing based on a wrong assessment Fair of enough. fact by... Yes. So the effort by the government of Ghana in February, March 2021, when I was not a tenure at that time, to challenge the award was actually just an extra step being made by the government. Was it not, no, just, was it not, was it not a window dressing, though? No, it was not. If no, you know no, that was not because the, the because three bases no. for the appeal, yes. you, you, you don't have evidence of corruption, you can't say you were not aware, and you can't say they don't have jurisdiction. No, hold on. So Omnia strategy indicated in their um, correspondence, which, of course, I'm not authorized to disclose to you on account of lawyer-client confidentiality, but there's, of course, record <laughs> showing com communication even between the head of the attorney at that time, office of attorney at that time, the source and um, plus other persons, showing that they indicated that certain grounds could be canvassed for an appeal. And those were actually deemed legitimate. Because do, do, those are lawyers, established law firm in London, mm. headed by reputable barristers, uh, Sherry Blair, QC, and all. And then two days to the deadline. And then a day before, not even two days before, a day before, 7th March. 7th March, <laughs> the deadline given to them to file the challenge was 8th March. And 7th March, they indicated that upon Perusa of, of the document... But does they, that not say something about the judgment of the legal team that even agreed to that proposal in the first place? No, I think we'll, we'll come to that. But I'm saying, so this, no, this I'm talking about that specific issue, that if somebody has come to you, yeah, that, no, I'm well, going to precisely. appeal something. So, and and then eventually, reasons, yes. You've agreed. Therefore, you are yes. hoping and expecting that they will do the appeal. Because you know the appeal has a certain time to elapse. Yes. Two days to the end of the appeal, they, they tell you. Fall. So I'm just saying, but that's your judgment. So yes. you should take the fall as the government and as a, as a department. Oh, so, so, so the government is not entitled to act on, on advice by lawyers in London. All governments have relied no, on No, but you chose advice. them, and they disappointed you. So yeah, I'm saying, <laughs> yes, so, no, no, so it, I did not choose them. I, I, I was not attending. I did not choose them. I was not attending at that time. I was mm. not in office. The decision, as I said, obviously, attend you at that time by law, Legal Service Act is the Solicitor General in the absence of the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General. It is for this reason that the President did not even have the capacity to appoint a representative for the Minister of Justice. Because <laughs> the law prescribes who fills the, vac the vacuum when the Attorney General and Deputy Attorney General That's the Solicitor General. Yeah, Solicitor General. Yeah, but, so but, but the government doesn't, is, that, but government government doesn't that, end. Yeah, but I'm no, so what is the argument now? We are not, the, the, argument not, not, the argument I'm initially. I'm not here to blame yes. you. We are saying that a government has known about something since April 2017. A government has agreed to go for arbitration. Yes. After a, a period of back and forth, the arbitration award has been uh, given against us. Fine. We say we'll go <coughs> for an appeal based on somebody's advice. We agree to what the person says. Yep. A day before the, the date for filing the appeal, the person says, I can't do it. Now, we can say that all of that put together, we are not putting the blame on Godfrey Dami, but we are saying... The Attorney General's Department, Solicitor General, whoever was in charge of the whole process, who knew the dates, failed the country. That's, that's the point I'm making to you. So the law firm had up to 8th March to file. Yes. The law firm could file on 8th March. Yes. And before the lapse of time, there had not been any indication that such a challenge could not be filed. That indication was only given on 7th March. So how could the Attorney General's office then headed by Solicitor General, be responsible? Well, unless you're telling me that the way, <laughs> what you, I'm the, saying, way, the way the work happens is that you only get to know the day before if they will file. Because I'm sure if somebody's going to file no, but I'm saying, I'm saying to at you, two weeks or a week before, you know whether there are discussions, whether there are uh, submissions and things. And so I'm it shouldn't come you, as a surprise. No, it will, because indeed there was a request for provision of documents by the solicitors. There, there was a back and forth between the solicitors. And I'm saying to you that the, the day that they disclose, the disclosure of a failure to file the um, arbitral award was on 7th March. Fair enough. Let's talk about you. <laughs> so that's you, it. You, were, so you were sworn in on 8th. On 5th March. 5th. 
Yes. So and then of course the Fifth next working was day was a holiday. Mm -hmm. So what what did you specifically do, having learned of this situation? Precisely. So what I did, I um, I was sworn in on first March Friday, mm -hmm. sixth March was a Saturday, seventh March the Sunday, the day that Omnia represented that they couldn't. Eighth March was a holiday. Eighth March was a holiday. So on my first working day, ninth March, I straight away met with the president and informed him of the situation. The president concerned about, about it. In fact, we all found it a, a little bit curious because in that communication by Omnia strategy was an indication that they could settle the matter for us if we desired. So really, instead of filing the challenge, they had offered opportunity of settlement. Any reasonable person would think that indeed that is actually why Omnia, Omnia strategy then even represented that they could, they could <laughs> file, file, file the matter. They just wanted to get a foot in, in, in the proceedings. I wouldn't want to impute such motive to them. They are a reputable law firm in Britain, headed by a person of immense stature in Britain, Sherry Blair, wife of um, former Prime Minister Tony Blair. And she on her own, not just on account of her husband's teacher, on her own, is a top barrister in her own right. So I wouldn't want to impute a motive at all to her. So we found a little bit curious and uh, we indicated that, well, so we took the view that if indeed Omnia had assessed the matter as worthy of a challenge then perhaps we could get a, a second opinion so we engage a law firm of a Volterra theater to also attempt um, a challenge and they were and said well it's, it's possible it's what they, 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 the only issue at that time was to get an extension of time within which to bring a challenge and they failed and they, which is what's important hold on, i'm coming i'm coming so even on your strategy what they got was also the sense of time yeah. but at that time there had not been such application Good. so once was really given as a matter of course. Mm. So the reasons for the sense of time were what the lawyers then had to come up with. And the lawyers said, well, they took the view that even the late appointment of the attorney general, the um, COVID-19 and all, um, taking account of certain circumstances, bureaucracy. bureaucracy and all. So th th those, were <laughs> those were things in their own judgment. That, that was the judgment of the foreign law firm and they took the view and if indeed I'm a practicing lawyer in Ghana, not a practicing lawyer in the UK, if a practicing lawyer, again, under a reputable, very big international, public international law firm, Volterra yeah. Theatre, a very Robert Volterra, also a long established QC with a big practice around the world. This so means that I'm just on clarify. So, so you're really saying that for you, happens. a day into your coming into office, you yeah. meet the president, you try so this last minute attempt to get to an extension, to think through, to see if it's possible to go and make a representation. Yep. That fails. And your point is that yep. that being presented as you sleeping on the job is unfair. Completely mischievous and I'm sure deliberate, deliberately so, for, for, because they know that I am interested in coming after them in respect of a number of matters, which I will not disclose because indeed they'll be fired in no time. And that is why they, they do so. And, and, and the point they feel to take account of, the point they withhold from the public, is that at all material times, the time of the delivery of the judgment, the time of the first application by um, uh, Sherry Blair, I was not in office as a tenure. I came into office in a bid to s go the extra mile for the government of Ghana. So my effort was just in, in the, in so the spirit of going the extra mile for the government of Ghana. against your person because oh, of the sorry. position you occupy and the work you want to do. No problem. But, but it's very, let's, let's backtrack a bit, though. It comes to the position. It's, it's when you, when you read the report of the committee headed by the then Executive Secretary of Energy Commission, Dr. Hinkra, they said government may consider terminating the PP of GPGC um, with an installed capacity of 107 megawatts at an estimated cost of $18 million or I think else. That, hold on. I think that no, no, let me just finish. No, hold on. Uh, we come, uh, just, just, just a quick um, okay. point I want to make. But I think that if, if the records will show that that allegation by them sleeping on the job is inconsistent with what the record shows. My record actually speaks to the state saving huge sums of money in various cases. The recent one which was reported, say I saved the state an amount of about 1.3 billion cities. Which in case? The, which the case? NDK matter, a judgment <laughs> against NDK. The case that I had revived on my own when I was getting to the end of my uh, term as deputy attorney and no, judgment also delivered just about two weeks ago. Yes, matter that they stayed on account of having entered into a judgment uh, into a transaction uh, with a value of about 268,000 Ghana um, cities. And as a result of the computation mm. of compound interest, mm. 
we're going to be started with a cost of about 1.3 billion. I, I, I succeeded in saving it. There's also another arbitral award, which they have perhaps deliberately so maybe hidden from the public. Who are you, who are you oh, the 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 <laughs> the the opponents, <laughs> if you may say. <laughs> and the op I mean, we've got there's this arbitral award. Also, as well of the effort to terminate a contract with us unnecessarily entered into by the NDC, and the um, claimants were claiming an amount of 1.1 1 .1 billion and 88 million cities. 1 billion 88 million cities against the government. This is still Ghana. a power purchase still agreement. Still, power purchase What's agreement. the name of the company? West African Gas Limited. And we succeeded we, during the same time that the arbitral proceedings were conducted in August. I think this one came in August, July. The ruling again came um, in January. And the state got off with just about 68 million um, USD. So from 1 billion and 88 million dollars, we an am a amount of 68 million also is awarded. Does that not constitute substantial savings to the state? That, that's, Cle that's clearly, the, the, the accusation <coughs> that you've been sleeping on a job has egged you. So I've allowed you the space to explain and show that actually you've been trying to save the state money. I have no problem with that. What I wanted to do in my premise, which you didn't allow me to say when I was not in office. I, I get that point. <laughs> I just wanted to take you back to uh, yeah. what the committee assumption was. Okay, the, as com the committee said that if we did not terminate the contract, we would pay at least $24 million per year for four years, which by normal calculation would be about $100 million to this company called GPGC. Yep. On the basis of that, they said we should terminate. Okay. I know there's a legal side and a financial right. side. Now, this was in 2017, 2018. Now we're in 2021. Yeah. We are going to pay in excess of $138 million. Again, I'm coming back to your yeah. team. <coughs> Clearly, the financial and legal calculations were wrong. Because they knew that if you terminate, the people could go for arbitration. And they knew the arbitration was not appealable except the yeah. three conditions. And they also assumed that <coughs> the amount we would incur in cost would be much lower than the amount we would pay if we allowed yeah. the contract to proceed. Yep. That was also not true. You were deputy at NGL at the time. There are many things you do, but again, collateral damage. Mm. You obviously have to say that your government misunderstood or made mistakes which cost us at least $38 million. Cost us $38 million? Because your calculation was that we would have paid $100 million. We are paying $138. Yep. The committee said mm. that if we went, uh, we went along with the contract, it will cost us $100 million <coughs> over four years, at least. Yep. We are paying... 138 million based on this arbitration award, it yeah. could be more. And we don't even know whether we are supposed to pay it immediately over a, a spread period. So my argument is that the team of which we were part of failed the country and cost us at least $38 million. Right. So I think that first and foremost, um, that question then puts in, into perspective the need to enter into such an agreement in the first place. And I'm saying that there was an absolute need, um, as, uh, 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 there was, an, was just totally unnecessary for the state to enter into the agreement. And that is because on account of the determination by a committee set up by the NDC itself in September 2016, the Ankara Committee, whose report was tendered early 2017. And of course, when we as in office, we allowed the Ankara Committee to proceed because really the government is a continuum. <laughs> that agreement was necessary. The agreement was one as per determination of the Ankara Committee was, was was, was, was unnecessary because it was going to result in excessive capacity development. And so the question must be asked as to why a government, considering the need to enter into an emergency purchase, a power purchase agreement for the purpose of solving the use of crisis, will transact an agreement which was unnecessary. And it was not just that agreement. They had transacted numerous PPA agreements. So the NDC itself realizing that we're saddled with a normable PPA agreement, set up a committee to constitute, I mean, constitute a committee to examine the feasibility of, of allowing the um, agreement to run or to terminate some of them. And that committee came out with a clear determination that, yes, this agreement is one that should be terminated. It should be terminated because it will result in excessive capacity development. Secondly, um, was very expensive. And also, practically, it will be quite difficult for it to be operated. They cited factors as the location of the gas and the connections to certain equipment and all. 
that we're lacking. So <laughs> I think that is, that is where we must first determine who is to blame for the argument. Then secondly, if an unnecessary argument is being entered to, and <laughs> that has been executed, the terms of the argument itself must be examined. The terms of the argument were unquestionable, were ones that clearly exposed the nation to unnecessary financial loss right from the outset. Because clause one of the argument specified the effective date of the argument, and it specified it to um, I, I define the effective date to mean the date upon the attainment of conditions precedent. It, it clearly, per Ghana law, if conditions precedent to an agreement are not satisfied, the argument is not effective. And no obligations or rights accrue to any of the parties under the agreement. No obligations can be enforced under the agreement. But rather absurdly, clause 2A of the agreement then defined the term of the agreement. The term of the agreement was to start from the signature date, not when the, the condition precedent had been fulfilled. Then further, clause 2B also stipulated that when the agreement is terminated before, I mean, the, before it had become effective, its term, in the course of its term, regardless of how it is done, the party not responsible for the termination will be liable to expenses set out under clause 25. Clause 25 was what then <laughs> catalogued all those charges that a party not responsible for a default will be um, um, liable to obtaining against the other party. And that is really essentially that the person will be entitled to claim all expenses made together with all amounts that will arise under the agreement, if the agreement were to run to, to, it, for, to it for course. So I made the point that the agreement is that was structured in such a way as to unjustly impose burdens, financial burdens on the state. And, 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 and that, for me, is what must be, must be questioned. And that is what I said I'm going to refer to the CID. I'm sure we'll come to that later on. Now, when the Hinka Committee recommended um, termination of the, of the agreement, the Attorney General then, who was not a technical person, and who is definitely not a technical person, was compelled to act. Mm -hmm. So Madame Gloria Kufu advised that, yes, on account of the fact that the agreement had not become effective on account of the reasons given also in the Ahinkra report uh, and all that the agreement should be terminated. And that decision was carried out by the Minister for Energy, then Bwachi Jaku. And Bwachi Jaku, before carrying out the termination, laid the, spread, it, spread it out to Parliament, went to Parliament and indicated. And indeed, a comparative analysis was made as to <laughs> the profitability or otherwise of terminating this together with other PPA agreement. As for the termination of the Ahinkra Committee, if all the PPAs that had been entered into by the um, NDC unjustifiably were allowed to run to um, conclusion, in, by 2018, an amount of $586 million was going to be paid by the state, even though the state did not need the power generated, or even when the, 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 there was no power generated at all by, by, by the arguments in question. So as against terminating some of them, and perhaps paying, as we all know today, 138, one whatever. As against terminating that one and incurring such a cost, and also terminating, um, uh, or allowing the argument to, 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 to run to conclusion where we didn't need them, and rather incurring losses of $586 million. If you were a business person, which, which, is, which option will you, will you opt for? So this is the point of view. We're talking to Attorney General <coughs> Godfrey Yebo Adami, the main issue we are discussing is the judgment that we've incurred as a country. Let me just read what the International Court of Arbitration said in its ruling, ordered the government of Ghana to pay GPGC the full value of the early termination payment, together with mobilization, demobilization, and preservation and maintenance costs in the amount of $134.3 million, together with interest thereon from 12 November 2018 until the date of payment accruing daily and compounded monthly at the rate of LIBOR for six months, US dollar deposits plus 6%. Some people have translated this to me. We are paying 170. AG says he doesn't think that's the figure. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we'll try and understand a few other things around the reasoning behind the decision government took to go this route and also deal with some other matters of concern 
to the country which are legal. Stay with us. Nothing wakes me up better than a cup of cowbell coffee. Delicious coffee aroma. Mmm. How can you forget your lines again? I'm sorry, sir, just that it tastes really good. Cowbell coffee! Enjoy the delicious creamy coffee taste of three in one cowbell taste coffee. It love and love. It's a beautiful day. Oh! This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Bonjour, monsieur, madame, et voilà. Ah, babe, what is this? Is this is the escargot and the foie gras? Oui. Where did she go? You pa one casa un huse or base or pay fear the end. Eh? It's been long since you ever felt like this. Welcome to the best in Ghanaian entertainment on Aquaba Magic. Welcome home to Aquaba Magic on DSTV Channel 150. It's your moment. DSTV. It's a good day to meet every challenge. It's a good day to want more out of life. It's a good day to wish for it, work for it, go get it. Familiar taste, a delicious indulgent with a flavor you just can't hide. Refreshing energy, gives so much for so little. For a strong performance, you've come to the right place. Good day energy drink. Why wait a minute to enjoy a good day when every second counts? Good Day Energy Drink keeps you going. Excessive drinking can be detrimental to your health. Not recommended for persons under 18 years, lactating mothers, pregnant women, and people sensitive to caffeine. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Welcome back to the point of view. Tonight we're talking to the Attorney General, Honorable Godfrey Yebo Adami. Thank you for, for staying with us. I read earlier today that you had suggested that you would let the CID investigate some of the people who were involved in all of this. Because in your previous answer, you were saying that the main problem was even entering such an agreement. My pushback to you before you deal with that is, yes, we've entered an agreement which doesn't make sense to you. Now you're saying, if we go for the agreement, we will pay <coughs> twenty-five million dollars for four years. That's hundred million. If we cancel the agreement, your calculation was that we're only going to pay eighteen million. This is what the committee said. We've canceled the agreement, and we are paying almost hundred and forty million. Now, if somebody's sin is going to cost us hundred million, and your redemption is costing us one forty million, why should we? Why should we blame you? Your solution should have cost us less than the original sin. That's my yep. point. Well, I think first of all, the, the um, determination by the committee that only an amount of 18 million would be payable in the event of termination was probably erroneous on the face of it because that determination was perhaps with, without regard to the consequences for termination set out in the agreement. That's why I will take you back to the agreement itself. So apart from the decision to enter into the agreement, the consequences for termination set out in the agreement that was signed by Dr. Kwame Adonkor itself exposed the nation to financial loss, irrespective of when the agreement was terminated. Because in the agreement, as I indicated earlier on, whether you terminated even before conditions precedent had been satisfied, which was the case here, um, the state will be exposed to payment of all sums that ordinarily the state that paid under the agreement, plus other costs and expenses. And that was what we witnessed. Now, to suggest that the um, cost of redemption of the situation 
<laughs> was 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 it's more, more expensive. It's also with all respect. Based on what the committee said. No, no, but the no, committee no, is telling us that we'll, committee, it will pay. No, hold on. Yeah. I think the committee is important to take account of the fact that this termination was in the context of the termination of some PPAs which are not necessary at, at all. And indeed, if you take account of the global picture, the termination of this together with other PPAs, I think resulted in um, still pay me, pay me, paying an amount of about maybe $500 million or so. And that's measured against the cumulative figure of $17 billion that the state was going to, to, to suffer if the agreements had been allowed to run. All the agreements, not this. this and this is one. still what the committee is saying. It's all the committee so is saying. So why should we, so take, that's why should one. we take that and not take the other one they said? Yeah, because, because that one that they said perhaps was due to an inadequate examination of the relevant provisions in the agreement. Because if, the, if one examines the agreement adequately, indeed, and the tribunal made that determination that the, tribu and the committee was wrong because that was not the case if you look at the agreement. And the, I think it's page 143 of the award. If you read it, the tribunal indicated that under the agreement, by virtue of clause 3D, the state would still have incurred uh, the amount that it awarded, irrespective of whether it terminated before fulfillment of conditions precedent or not. So really, I think that's the case. Now, so my answer to the question is that if you look at the global situation, where if the all the PPAs, that is this plus 11 others or so, which were either terminated or deferred, uh, were allowed to run to their conclusion, where an amount of 586 million will be paid by Ghana, government of Ghana each year, and a total amount of um, 17.6 billion or so will be paid between 2018 and 2030. This clearly was, was a better um, really? um, option, because really, if, if you add this 100 and you call it 170, Add this together with other amounts that have been paid. Mm. My information is that it's just about 500 or something. But, million. but AJ, what is curious is that and this DPGC agreement was under, there were three types of agreement. Yes. There were the committed, there were the candidate agreement, and then once under discussion. Yes. Curiously, GPGC was in the same group as Amandi, Sonona Sogli, Eli Power, AXA, Car Power, and Jacobson. So that there's, we, we assume and we have admit that there's yep. le some level of commitment. Yeah. Which means that legally we know that the implications of termination will not be the same as Astro or the others under candidate. Yes. So, so I'm saying that this is not just a financial mistake. Right. If it is a mistake in terms of the calculation right. to terminate. Yes. Because you know that this is grouped under a separate arrangement. Right. So if based on whoever advised us to terminate, knowing that if you go to arbitration, right. you can't appeal and you could, it will cost you the length of how much you pay, I'm still saying that we shouldn't just blame the committee. But I think we should also blame the legal advice that agreed to terminate. Well because they knew that this committee, this, this particular yeah. agreement could not be treated like the others. Yeah, but I would be handicapped in addressing the legal sufficiency of the decision to terminate. In the sense that I was not the attainer at that time. Madame Gwere Kufu was the attainer. And uh, indeed, she didn't even take the decision alone. That decision, as the record shows from the even the arbitral award, was also subject to evaluation by cabinet. I, I was not a member of cabinet. I was only a member of cabinet from 6 March 2020 <laughs> when I was sworn in as a member of the cabinet, 6 March, not 5th March. So um, I think that those are, I, I will not really be um, competent to speak to the reasons why that legal decision was taken. But I'm saying that indeed that legal decision taken again in the context of the global solution, which was to save the nation an amount of about um, 17 billion dollars over 12 years or 586 million dollars over one year for me was better so now that you are aging would you take all the assumptions in the committee's report with a pinch of salt now because on the specific issue of gpgc their legal and financial analysis yeah. has clearly not panned out the way they did yeah. so that 500 million that they say would pay now that you're sitting in this mm. office are you minded to say, let me look at all of this again? Yes. Because the ones we've agreed to terminate, yep. if some of them go the route of GPGC, we could also incur more costs than they initially told you. Well, I think, I think that clearly has been exhibited by me. I've indicated that first and foremost, I'm going to even refer part of, of the process for the examination by the Criminal Investigation Department. And that inquiry will even establish whether it was necessary for the agreement to be entered into 
um, whether the, indeed it was expensive, as the ANCA committee indicates. And, and, and also, yes, I've also, I mean, now the horses are booted. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that going forward, there ought to be a proper examination of um, processes of review of this power purchase agreement. And I've already indicated, so I've already started, there are numerous energy cases that we, we are fighting, even the court of Ghana, um, ENI and Springfield versus their tenure. These are all part. And I think that the whole energy sector, if not properly managed, has a tendency to result in financial loss to the state. But the way government and indeed works, it started, the, the, the way it's government works with, sorry to cut you, mm. the power purchase agreements are typically led by energy and finance. Yes. Now, AG is brought in to advise. Yes. Based on this experience of these power purchase agreements, would, would you be able to recommend a change in that arrangement? Because even when Parliament announced that we had too much power that we could not yes. use, it was the finance minister who announced it. So these are usually energy initiated, finance executed, and then law comes Brought into examine parts at of the end of the day and sometimes yeah. take the blame. So my question is, have you seen enough to say that that triangle has to change in terms of when you come into the conversation. Yes, it has. And, and indeed, I, I'm not en, um, entitled to disclose matters relating to our proceedings in cabinet. But I can assure you that really now there has been some kind of reform of the process and, and I think that things will pan out better. But I will say, end on that point by saying that the state clearly was saved incalculable financial loss by decisions taken by the MPP. The report shows that if all the agreements have been allowed to run, we're going to suffer 17.6 billion over the period and 586 million per year. Of course, if um, some expenses, uh, losses have been made result to certain decisions, it's something that really warrants a reconsideration. If the CID finds that there was wrongly by the previous administration, would you be minded to prosecute? I think not a matter of being minded. I will be enjoined by duty to prosecute. What if the people say we have gone back to blaming the previous administration for problems we could not solve, that you've been in power for five years now, and you are going to be taking people who are in power in 2010 to 2015, 2016 to court? Well, crime has no statute bar, one answer. Second answer is that, well, you're a public officer, you must act in accordance with the details of your oath. My oath is, is to ensure that there's due administration of justice in the country. And that is what I would do. A, f a few um, contemporary. This, this has nothing to do, do with any personalities or characters in question. Some of them may be my friends. I take decisions all the time. Yeah. Sitting in this desk, friends of mine have even come for favor. Said I have disregarded them. It happens all the time. Okay. So not to belabor the point, though. This we've known that these agreements ought not to have been entered into, at least from your side, from 2017. Yes. We are in 2021. You are now asking the CID to go into this. Um, the question, though, is why has it taken this long? Because it was quite clear, at least from what you are telling me, that you even say that the committee, which was initiated by the previous government, knew that some had to be terminated. It's taken us at least four years to now say we are going to get CID to investigate. Okay, again, that could open door to say, look, this is a, a, this is a sort of an afterthought. Well, I, th I think I think again, you seeking to drag me into a situation that I wanted to avoid. That is perhaps an examination of certain decisions taken by my predecessor, my former boss, now Greg Gufre, a person I worked with. I only want to really comment on, on, on reasons why it's taking so long. But I'm saying that to the extent that the factors necessitating such an inquiry immediately occurred in March 2021. Okay. It is really not too late at all. Because if the state had won the arbitration proceedings, we'll not be talking about any financial loss whatsoever. This is still the point of view. We're talking to the Attorney General, Godfrey Yebo Adami, on a number of issues. We'll be, we'll be right back. Stay with us. New Pepsi and Herbal. Introducing a unique combination of herbal extracts in an antibacterial toothpaste for strong teeth and healthy gums that protects your family and you. Every small matters. It's a free header! Goal! Look 
Looking for the ultimate football experience? To feel every emotion, to be part of the conversation, and to live every banter. Looking for Ronaldo, Hazard, Sterling, for massive skills and out-of-this-world moments. Come and get it. Watch the UEFA Euro 2020 live on Supersport from 11 June to 11 July on Go TV. Love it. With ATL, you can never be out of style. ATL, bringing fabric to life. drink keeps you going available in major supermarkets and shops near you excessive drinking can be detrimental to your health not recommended for persons under 18 years lactating mothers pregnant women and people sensitive to caffeine this advert is fda approved the big issue brings you analysis of the biggest news stories of the week. The clerk should not assume the role of being the one through whom Kwesin should be served because Kwesin was not yet a member of parliament and not yet subject to his jurisdiction. And the thinking has always been that when you come to parliament, you are coming to enrich yourself. When you are here, it's nasa. No matter how good you are. Join me every Saturday morning as we bring context and meaning to the biggest issues of the week. The MPP Mm -hmm. has got to quickly win its mind off the last four years because they are you're in a false sense of security at a point it was so bad that the president of the republic then who was the leader of the new patriotic party president kufo had to issue a statement to encourage the electoral commission to declare the winner so he could use the power and the authority of government to ensure that the winner was supported. My name is Godfred Akutubuafu, and this is The Big Issue. Every Saturday at 10 a.m., only on City TV. with a few other issues. You, you, you are clearly interested in saving the state money. The Galamse fight is going on right. and there have been comments made about burning excavators. I'm sure I've spoken to this before, but let me just ask you. There, there appears to be an eagerness to stop Galamse so much that we risk breaking the law to enforce this particular fight. So the idea of saying, go to court if you feel your excavator is being burnt illegally. Are you sure that in three, four years, we'll not be sitting here talking about judgment debts that we have incurred as a state because the law is quite clear on what to do with a confiscated excavator. Burning is not one of them. Well, even before um, the burning orders, if I may say so, were issued, apparently there had been some judgment that granted against the government of Ghana in that Already? regard. Yes, I got to know from Randy Abbey on the program on Joy FM that there had been some award last year. Mm. And the following Monday, I set out to investigate, and indeed I found that there had been a judgment debt of about $50 million granted. And that was in, I think, uh, July or June last year, in respect of some activities 
um, from the inter ministerial committee. At that time, there was no bending at all. So really, I think that judgment debt, of course, um, really sometimes becomes unavoidable. But even in respect of that particular judgment debt, even though the time for an appeal has elapsed, I really intend um, challenging it on procedural grounds. And I think that the procedural grounds really will, 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 will not be caught by any flash of time and all. And I believe that the media ought to encourage me in that regard. After all, it's, it's the same public press that we are seeking to save. And if that effort to challenge the uh, judgment given by the High Court in Kumasi last year that I became aware of only when I became a tangerer, I feel mm -hmm. I do not think that the state, the, the, the media, should <laughs> perhaps take me. I, I get that. I just, I'll just go in there. Yeah, but I'll, I'll, I still come to so, the question so back of to the, the question. burning. The burning. I think that the, yeah, the burning, is, again, comes back to the legal perspective that we look at the matter from. Because I am also aware of the decision of the High Court in Kumasi in Estin, Quebec, a matter that I personally conducted in which equipment had been wrongly seized by um, the Ashanti Regional Minister then and had been kept at the police station for many, almost over a year, over a year. And, and, and the company in question was claiming an amount of 12 million Ghana cities against the, 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 the government. We successfully fought it off on the ground that to the extent that the equipment were being used for illegal purposes, no consequence or to f follow from a seizure of, of the equipment. So the principle that we're operating with is that no right accrue to a person who is engaged in illegality. And that's a principle recognized by the, the courts of Ghana. It's actually captured in a Latin maxim, STP causa or non rita too. So really, these are principles of law, they established. So, but, we, but that, we'll would, that would depend on whether we are clear that the person whose excavator is being yeah. bent is breaking the law. Because we do know that yes. there are people who legitimately have license to mine. So that if you, if you take the position yeah, that bending yes. an excavator for a, illegal mining is, is you don't have any rights, I can't argue with that. Yeah. But how do you know that everybody whose excavator is being bent is doing the wrong thing? Yeah, but that, it's up to the state then to conduct a proper diligence um, to ascertain that the person that you're proceeding against, whose equipment you are burning, is actually engaged in illegal mining. It happens all but the time. But that's not in your control. Hold on. Yeah, it's not in my the control. The ministry is burning excavators. Precisely. It is even just like arrest. <laughs> when a policeman engages in unlawful arrest, you know, it's something that is on your control. But um, if the person decides to sue, that danger always defends. And if yeah, that's nothing, but so the, the yeah, so danger in the burning is that you are not in control of yeah. whose excavator is bent. If we know that, if we have said, don't use excavator to do anything in Ghana, and therefore if you use an excavator, you are broken the law, then if you bend the excavator, I don't have any right. Yes. But to the extent that there are people who are legitimately using excavators, the strategy of let's bend excavators, we confiscate on the allegation that they are doing galamse. It's very false. No, but, but usually they conduct an inquiry, um, they ins inspect your, your, your permits and, and licenses and all before moving in. If they negligently <laughs> fail, to, fail to do that and they just seize the equipment, that would really expose the state to damages and what have you. But, but, but at one decision, so, so can you also allude to any decision to a contrary? No, but we are, uh, and that decision but, was but actually decision, subjected to an appeal. Said, but one decision, yes. one decision does not override the full, uh, a general principle. No, but that a person is innocent yes. until proven guilty. But that general principle is that a person engaged in an illegal activity has no right, and that no right has to if. yes, precisely. You don't know if I'm doing an illegality because I have an excavator. But, but so see me with an excavator somewhere and confiscating and burning it on your own, so moto as a military person, yeah, but on the basis that you suspect me of doing as gal galam say, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that Bernard, as, as, I have as indicated to, you, to the lawyer, yeah, but you should I be concerned that that can be but abused. I have indicated to you that indeed the, the people engaged in the exercise are required to conduct the necessary inquiries and investigations before. They do not just go and, and see the excavators. They have to. They do, do so to be negligent. But the, even <laughs> in the Jemfua case, they said the people just came and completed their guns and started, started, started burning them. I mean, there have been, uh, there have been well, reports on so, the ground of, so of excesses. No, I think that we cannot really, on this forum, without having seen any documents by any person or examining circumstances, and just be passing judgment that the people are just seizing equipment. I think that would also be unfair to the persons, persons engaged in the exercise because the exercise is conducted by military, police, and, 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 and officers, uh, Ministry of Na Land and Central Resources, and who have been properly mandated to carry out the, uh, the exercise lawfully. And they do so after having 
peruse and investigated the authenticity of documents that are, uh, are in the possession of, 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 of those whose equipment have been seized. And most of the time, it's on account of persons who do not have any equipment at all, licenses at all. So I think we ought not to be judgmental. We ought not to lead the public to uh, unduly <laughs> having yeah. an impression that it's, it's, it's really an illegal activity that's been engaged in. Two, two final points, and thank you for your indulgence. The, the issue of LGBTQ advocacy and government's keenness to stamp it out, the whole 21 keeps coming up. We are told that there are 21 people who were held for three weeks without bail. Their human rights were violated before eventually an uproar led to their release. I don't know if you are aware of this. Yes, In I'm Internationally, aware. there's a lot of backlash about how this country treats those people. What is the, the thinking around that particular whole judge deciding not to give them bail at least three times? So first and foremost, I'm not aware that the people um, arrested in who were arrested for an LGBTQI activity. What I am aware of is that they were charged with offense of unlawful assembly and they were denied bail because the people had congregated um, from various parts of the country. They hailed from various parts of the country, some from Boko, some from Takrade, some from um, Eastern Region, and they were all congregated in Ho. And they couldn't explain why they were in the room, and in the hotel, in the room in the hotel for the purpose that they claimed that they, they were there for. So the charge was for unlawful assembly. And it's on account of their failure, um, it's on account of the fact that they were from various parts of the country and had no place of abode in Ho that were denied bail. And indeed, after they were denied bail by the circuit court, who the um, lawyer for the accused persons then filed an application at the at the um, high court, who the attorney general representative the, the uh, senior state attorney in who actually did not oppose bail, but the judge in his discretion refused bail. So I mean, the exercise of discretion by a judge cannot be subject to. Um, questioned by the executive. Indeed, a representative of the executive who is the attorney general's representative in Ho, the senior city attorney, did not oppose bail at all. So the, the accused persons had no option but to be returned to custody. Subsequently, a repeat application for bail was, was filed um, by the same lawyers and the same senior city attorney again did not oppose bail and forcefully urged for the court to reconsider its decision not to grant bail at that time and the bill was granted. So that is it. Okay. Now, regarding the, the state's position on LGBTQI, I think that the laws of Ghana which are being enforced. Beyond that, um, I'm not aware of a situation where the state has actually uh, meted out violence or the state has supported any uh, infliction of violence against those persons engaged in the activity. And again, I also ought to put on record that the right to engage in LGBTQI QI activi activity, which of course may be an exercise of somebody's fundamental human rights of free expression, should also warrant that when a person is opposed to the practice, that person should also be free to also engage in activity. So I deplore the situation whereby those who are engaged in anti LGBT QI activity are perceived to be backward and, 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 and looked upon. Um, in, in, in very bad terms. I think that if you have the right to advocate for the practice, one should also have the right to advocate against the practice. That's actually the, the height of female expression in the country, and I think that's, that, that's what ought to be the case. That was the Attorney General Godfrey Yebo Adami explaining many issues, of course the power issue being the main one and few other points. Thank you for watching. My name is Bernard Avila. We'll be with you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>